Magnesium. It's magnesium. I think you'll be surprised by how nuanced this topic is, though, because while many people talk about magnesium as if it's a nutrient that we can't get enough of, I have a far more cautious tale to tell, and I'll prove it. Magnesium isn't all good news, and when it comes to our brain, there's a lot to say, so let's get into it. So, yeah, many, many millions of people are low on their magnesium intake, and that can have quite some consequences on your brain. In fact, if we take a deeper look at how magnesium affects our brain, we get a great idea of why deficiencies can be so detrimental. That's partly shown here. In this study, which is a mechanism study, researchers wanted to know if you supplement with magnesium, does it enter the brain, among many other things. As we can see here, mice that were fed magnesium experienced an increase in brain magnesium. To be clear, this is also true for humans. We can see that when comparing the zero time there to the 24 days, one of the magnesium conditions experiences an increase in the fluid surrounding the brain called the cerebrospinal fluid. Now, what does it do once it's there? Well, in cognitive tests between magnesium fed and non-magnesium, so control fed mice, we see as indicated by the lines going up that magnesium improved cognitive performance. Essentially, they're taking the result from the control group and subtracting that from the magnesium group. And any rise in the line indicates a difference or benefit of the magnesium group. Okay, so we know that it goes into the brain and we know that it improves cognitive ability, but we should go a layer deeper because what exactly is this ion, magnesium, doing to our brain? You might already know this, but your brain has a variety of cells that make up its structure. And even within those cells, there are differences. But we'll focus on a major type of cell, the cell that allows you to think, to zone out to this video, to write comments telling me to get to the point and allows you to do many things is called the neuron. In a general explanation, your neurons communicate using two opposite ends of themselves. So one is called the dendrite and the other is called the axon. The dendrite is where the input from other neurons is accepted and the axon is where the output to other neurons is relayed. So the more of these connections there are between cells, the stronger the signaling between cells. Again, generally, because there are some exceptions. So the more of these axons, for example, that are in an area of the brain, the greater the chance to relay electrical and chemical signals from one neuron to the next, which is where we get to those wonderful abilities that I was talking about. You know, like clicking to join the Physionic Insiders. Too soon? Sorry. The point being, the more connections between these vital brain cells and neurons, the better the brain would function. So magnesium plays a role as we see here. The researchers have used an immunofluorescent stain to tag a particular protein called synaptophysin, which is in this context, a marker of axon terminals, the end of the axon that we discussed. So the more synaptophysin, the more axon terminals are in an area greater density, so a good thing. I think that the uh, images themselves, control on the left and the magnesium on the right, indicate already that there's more green in the right image, the magnesium-treated image. But if we look at the average results across multiple experiments, we see that confirmed. So as the black, the magnesium group bar, is elevated over the control. They did some other experiments to confirm these results as well. So this study that we went over tells us that greater brain magnesium levels improve the connectivity or at least the density between the neurons, which is pretty amazing. Okay, we at least know in animal models that magnesium plays an important role in our brain, but there are a lot of outstanding questions. One, does this apply to humans? Two, how do we use this information? And three, what bad news is still coming barreling down Nick's neuronless brain? Let's address the human aspect first. There is a study that looked at human brain size, so one reason for the title of this video, and the link with dietary magnesium across 6,000 people. 
In that study, the researchers identified that per one milligram increase in magnesium intake, there was a link to a 0.001% increase in gray matter, white matter, and size of a particular region of the brain called the hippocampus. There were also fewer lesions in the brain, areas of loss of axons, so more inflammation and general deterioration of the brain. So overall, in association with greater brain size and better quality of brain matter. We'll be coming back to this study because I have something else to say about it. The study that we just went over is informative, but it doesn't speak to the functional outcomes. As in, sure, the brain is bigger, the brain has better structure, but does that actually prevent us from brain-related disorders like dementia? So for that, there's a recent analysis that included 15 studies assessing the relationship between magnesium intake and blood levels and cognitive impairment. If we look here, we're looking at a forest plot with three of the 15 studies on the left side there. Why not all 15? Because these three were the only ones to assess dietary intake of magnesium and dementia specifically. The middle lines indicate a neutral relationship, but if the big diamond there moves to the right, that indicates increased risk of dementia from consuming above the estimated average requirement, or the EAR, ear. I'll go ahead and spoil it for you, there's no relationship here. Meaning consuming more magnesium was not associated with reduced dementia risk compared to consuming less. But this has some pretty glaring issues. If you'll allow me to point them out because there's some conflicting data within the same analysis that we have to reconcile this with. The forest plot that we just uh, went over only includes three studies. That alone can be a major strike. However, they also segmented based on a pretty crude black and white cutoff above and below the estimated average requirement. That is an imprecise way of teasing out data, although it may have been the only way to do it. The below group was consuming around 230 milligrams and the above group was consuming 370 milligrams. That may not be enough of a difference to tease out such a drawn out condition like dementia. Overall, the point is, I don't think that this is great quality data to make any definitive claims. On the other hand, the researchers analyzed the same data, but looked for a relationship per 100 milligram increase in magnesium intake. And when assessing that data linearly, as in 300 milligrams is better than 200 milligrams, which is better than 100 milligrams, they found no relationship between magnesium and dementia. On the other hand, when assessing non-linearly, they did find a relationship. So they identified a U-shaped relationship, as in consuming low levels of magnesium is related to dementia, but consuming high levels of magnesium was also related to dementia. Ah, now you're be beginning to see why there might be some warnings associated with all this. Another type of study that we might be able to lean on because we've been focused primarily on correlation data, except for the mechanism study that we discussed, is randomized controlled trials. These heavily indicate cause and effect, and there have been three randomized controlled trials on the topic looking at cognitive measures. I won't bore you with the more data, but I'll mention what happened briefly. Two studies found an effect of supplementing magnesium and the third did not. Two of the studies were classified as high risk of bias and all three studies were small, as well as in people with serious health cons com 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 complications <laughs> like cancer, liver cirrhosis, uh, and sur sur surgical patients. Woo, okay, pick it up, Nick. I should probably also mention that in the meta-analysis that we just went over, the majority of the studies were correlational. So I mentioned that already, but because that's the case, the researchers have to account for potential explanatory factors. Essentially, you have to scrub the data for anything that might be the real reason for this dementia risk was increased or reduced. So, for example, did body weight also track with the same as magnesium? Then we can't tell if it's the magnesium or the body weight that led to the relationship with dementia, unless we remove body weight relationship and see if the magnesium relationship remains. So the researchers did that, accounting for all these factors. However, one of the major issues related to looking at a single molecule like magnesium is the fact that it isn't a big player like exercise, body weight, or overall energy intake, and you know things of that nature. So, 
how can we reasonably account for things like calcium, sodium, and other related nutrients? It's possible, but it takes more robust adjustments than what we've been over here. Not to mention, not all included studies did the same adjustments, even if there was significant overlap. Okay, let me give you one more piece of bad news before I brighten your day with today's sponsor, Miracle Magnesium Mulberry Marshmallows. Packed with magnesium that may or may not track with dementia. Packed with sugar that really kickstarts your day and a mere 500 calories per marshmallow. This health snack will have you ripe for obesity in no time. Oh, and they had only limited input on my extremely positive conclusions related to magnesium at the end of this video. I pinky promise, just don't look at my bank account. I promise you, I promise you, someone will take that seriously. It happens every single time. No, but one more piece of bad news and then I'll shine a ray of hope and hopefully pack this all up nicely for you to understand and uh, for some takeaways. So half of you just let out an audible. Finally. Hey, I heard that. I mentioned uh, we'd return to this study and the reason is that uh, while they did find a relationship between magnesium and brain size, the sample size or the number of participants that they based some of their associations on was uh, one to 3% of the total sample. So the 6,000 participants total. That, especially considering the effect size, if you calculate it out, is about 0.1% increase in brain size per 100 milligrams of magnesium, at least according to some measures. So is that actually meaningful? I honestly don't know. It might be, but there's still a relationship with magnesium and brain size as well as brain quality. I just wouldn't want to buy into particular parts of this analysis with too much gusto. To be fair, the 0.1% increase is based on the total sample. So all that to say, there's a lot of problems in the literature, but even so, we'll be able to get an idea of how to think about magnesium in our brain. Assuming that we're not deficient, get it? Before we do, my magnesium deficient brain feels compelled to mention that if you found that first study on how magnesium affects our brain fascinating, I have a deep dive on some other incredible discoveries from that study, some additional mechanisms, and some more precise ways of linking magnesium like blood levels to our brain through other studies. If you're interested in a deeper dive and if your brain isn't scrambled from the science talk up to now, check out the extended version of this video that you're watching, along with the accompanying article in the Physionic Insiders, my premium research platform. You also get access to discuss it with me in upcoming live sessions, uh, also included with the membership. Oh, <clears throat> and there's a podcast, a whole library of other videos, articles, and much more. You can join using the uh, link in the description. I might even be able to snag you some M4s for you. That's the Miracle Magnesium Mulberry Marshmallows. Did you already forget? Come on. Okay, so overall, magnesium is an important nutrient. None of this literature that we went over is saying otherwise. Magnesium is also important for the brain, and it's even strongly regulated in the brain. And yes, being low in magnesium intake does seem to track with smaller brain volume, while consuming more tracks with more brain volume, as well as better brain composition. However, I did not think that the evidence is good enough to create a clear relationship between an exact amount of magnesium intake and brain health. In fact, I don't think that we have evidence that more is necessarily better. And even the researchers themselves point out that we need more studies, long-term associative studies, as well as adequate randomized controlled trials. But there does seem to be enough evidence that being too low repeatedly shows poor associations with brain health. So consuming below 240 milligrams of magnesium per day is too low. Then going up from there, the data becomes a lot murkier and impossible to tease out the optimal. So I would stick to at least the estimated average requirement of 350 milligrams per day for men and around 260 milligrams for women. However, that may also be very likely too low, especially for other health metrics. So the recommended daily allowance 
of around 400 milligrams for men and 320 milligrams for women seems a safer bet until we can get better evidence, at least for the brain. But brain atrophy or brain shrinking can also occur with age, and there are specific foods that slow the process impressively. You can check that out right here. Thanks for tuning in. See ya.